Hey there folks, Kevin Tracy here, and today I'm using the XP version of MS Paint to draw one of my favorite basketball players from the 1990s, Stacy King. I promise, I promise, I'll explain why. And please hang around until the end of the video. I end up coming up with three different backgrounds for this piece, and I would love it if you left a comment telling me which one you like best. If you're new to my videos, then welcome. I do mostly art, pixel art, and woodworking videos on my channel. However, instead of just creating tutorials to tell you how to draw what I draw and how to create what I create, I instead try to share my thoughts and motivations that inspire my artwork with the hope that it may get you thinking and maybe even get your creative juices flowing so you can create something unique of your own. If that sounds like something you may be interested in, then I hope you consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon so you can get notified of my future videos. I'd love it if you joined our growing community here on YouTube. Anyway, as some of you may already know, I grew up in Northwest Indiana during the 1980s and 1990s in a suburb of Chicago. Now, when I think of my childhood, I think of it in stages. At first, there were the Smurfs, and then there were the Ghostbusters, and then there were the Ninja Turtles, and then there were the Chicago Bulls. And while the Ninja Turtles and Ghostbusters were national cultural phenomenon, their significance pales in comparison to that of the Chicago Bulls in the 1990s in the Chicagoland area. I, words really can't do this justice, but let me put it this way. I'm a nerd and a geek. I am today, I was when I was a kid. And to make matters worse, I was also chronically shy. But I was a Bulls fan and I loved basketball. And because of that, I made friends as a kid who I never would have even talked to otherwise. I learned how to communicate better and I learned to have confidence. And today, even though I'm not really a fan of professional sports anymore, I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for the Chicago Bulls in the 1990s. And my story isn't all that unique. The 90s Bulls touched more lives than even the players are ever gonna realize. I think it was for the reason that my wife suggested, and I quote, you should draw Michael Jordan or someone. And yeah, Michael Jordan was undoubtedly the phenomenon behind the phenomenon. This was a very special time for the NBA in general. Enormously talented and truly legendary players populated many of the teams in both the Eastern and Western conferences. And any game between two playoff caliber teams was like watching the Harlem Globetrotters versus the Harlem Globetrotters without any of the silly gimmicks. And this was night in and night out, the greatest show on earth. It was like a rock concert. It was like a ballet. It was like a street fight if we were playing the Pistons or the Knicks. It was like a magic show. But most of all, I remember it as absolutely beautiful. Now, I don't mean to say that the beauty is totally gone from today's game, but I do think it is a lot less common. When I do see it, I sit in the TV still in amazement. But more often than not, I just kind of shake my head in disbelief until I either change the channel or fall asleep. Truth be told, the only reason I tune into Bulls games anymore is to listen to Stacey King's color commentary, which is probably the most entertaining thing the Bulls have going for them this season. Not only that, but you see, I've had this soft spot in my heart for Stacey King for a long time. It goes back to the 1992 NBA Finals, Game 5, and the series was tied 2-2. Two to two. Horace Grant had fouled out of the game halfway through the fourth quarter, so Cliff Levingston and Stacey King were getting more playing time. And Levingston had already seen quite a few minutes already and was presumably tired, so Stacey King was finishing out the game. The Portland Trailblazers had just tied the game 107-107 with 12 seconds left. And Stacey King inbounded the ball to Scottie Pippen, but immediately came under pressure. So he passed the ball back to King, and King then crossed the half court line towards the bottom of the screen. And with five seconds left on the game clock, unexpectedly, he fired up a half court three pointer. And my heart sunk. I still wasn't allowed to cuss at that age, so I couldn't say anything. But all I could think was that the Bulls blew it, that the Trailblazers were soon going to be one game away from winning the NBA Finals and my summer vacation would be ruined. And then out of nowhere, the ball drops to the bottom of the hoop and the announcer shouts, three. I couldn't believe it. He made it. I jumped for joy. And Clyde Drexler then fired off a desperation three-pointer from behind the half court line and that missed. And then the Bulls went on to win the NBA championship that year. It was one of the greatest moments of my childhood, and if you don't remember it, I'm not really surprised. You see, I was actually playing Bulls versus Blazers in the NBA playoffs on the Super Nintendo. Towards the end of my summer vacation, I played one game of the NBA playoffs every night on the hardest difficulty, full regulation time. This was my third or fourth attempt of the summer, and if I didn't win this time, my summer break would be over before I could reach the finals again. 
I was sweating bullets and I had to poop really bad. And in all the excitement, I hit the button to shoot rather than to pass the ball to BJ Armstrong, who would be able to give an easy assist to Jordan, who was in the paint and ready to score at the last second. I remember this so vividly because I passionately repeated the story to my sister and my mom and my dad that night. And I'm absolutely positive that none of them cared. My sister didn't even pretend like she was listening to me. I then repeated the story again to my sister and my mom and my dad the following morning and again the following night as the Bulls entered game six of the NBA Finals and I pretended to be the two guys doing the pregame show. And that's how Stacey King helped the Chicago Bulls win the 1992 NBA Finals in August of 1993. Of course it's silly, of course it's historically insignificant, but as a nine-year-old kid, it was the most exciting thing in the world. Anyway, I decided to draw Stacy King here, having just caught that pass from Scottie Pippen and having that look on his face of, like, I'm going to shoot this half-court shot and it's going to go in. Like, he was a man possessed with this one single thought of shooting the ball. And I kind of wonder if this was the look on my face when I realized that I was going to draw a picture of Stacey King instead of Michael Jordan. Like, a spirit of creativity just came over me and guides me into drawing something that nobody will ever expect and probably no one will ever buy. But creating art for me isn't just about selling my work, it's about expressing and capturing feelings like this one, this moment of absurd creativity. Now, granted, I'd probably be more financially successful as an artist with a lot more followers here on YouTube if I drew things that would be instant clickbait, like gender bending some modern pop culture icon, but that's not who I am. And unfortunately, that leaves a lot of people scratching their heads, my wife included. Uh, I thought you were drawing Michael Jordan. You told me to draw Michael Jordan or someone. So I drew Stacey King. Who the hell is that? Ah, great question. King was drafted as the sixth overall pick in the 1989 NBA draft by the Chicago Bulls after making first team All-American in Oklahoma. The Bulls were putting together their Pistons busting championship team and they needed some younger, bigger players. At six foot 11 inches tall, King was either a big power forward or a short center. And King filled both these roles in his career, which lasted an admirable eight seasons. After helping the Bulls win three championships, he was eventually traded to Minnesota in the 94-95 season for some draft options and Luke Longley, who was the starting center for the Bulls' second 3 peak. After spending a couple years with the Timberwolves, he signed with Miami and later Sacramento, and I think he signed some short-term deals with the Celtics and maybe another team in his ninth season before retiring. Now it's true, Stacey King never signed a shoe deal or starred in any McDonald's commercials. Some hardcore fans might even say he was a lousy player. But I would interject on this point. Consider for a moment that Stacey King even made it to the NBA at all. If each of the 29 teams at the time had 12 players, then Stacey King was among the top 348 players in the world. And at the time, there were 265 million Americans. This placed Stacey King in the elite top 0.0000139% of Americans. That's so ridiculously elite that civil leaders and responsible parents have for decades told kids and teens that it was foolish to plan their lives around playing in the NBA because realistically, they just weren't going to make it. Well, Stacey King was so ridiculously good that he not only made it to the NBA, but he stayed there for eight seasons. And among those eight years, he won three championships. Now think about that. How many great players of any sport have never celebrated a championship? King had that honor three times. Also consider that as a center, he had to compete in an era of legendary big men like Hakeem Olajuwon and Patrick Ewing, David Robinson, Shaquille O'Neal, Dikembe Mutombo, Karl Malone. And as a power forward, he was up against the incredible talents of men like Alonzo Mourning and Charles Oakley, Sean Kemp, Charles Barkley, Chris Webber, and Dennis Rodman. And he played against these guys for eight years. But there's something I find even more remarkable. Now, as a U.S. Air Force veteran, I'm proud of the work that I did as an intelligence analyst. Even though we rarely ever heard any words of thanks, I have no doubt that the work that we did saved lives and prevented life-altering amputations among both our fellow servicemen and the civilian population. We worked with both antiquated and state-of-the-art technology to seamlessly stitch together intelligence by analyzing raw data. We did our part to hunt down Al-Qaeda after 9-11. We did our part to capture Saddam Hussein, who was like the supervillain of my childhood. I get a free dinner at Applebee's on Veterans Day. But by far the best thing about my choice to enlist in the Air Force, the thing I'll always cherish most of all, is the honor of having served with the incredible men and women who I served with directly. 
And yeah, there were some jerks and idiots among them, but the vast majority of them are like part of my family, and 15 years after I've gotten out, I still love them to this day, and I'd go to the ends of the earth to help them. Having never been a professional athlete, I don't know if bonds like that form in sports, but I imagine it must at some level, and if it does, then consider the brotherhood that Stacey King is a part of. I mean, the guy practiced day in and day out with Hall of Famers like Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, and he was led by a Hall of Fame coach in Phil Jackson. You know, after traveling with Chuck Norris for a couple days several years ago, I no longer really get all fangirly over celebrities. These really are ordinary human beings who have some remarkable talent or even just some remarkable coincidence that makes them famous. Most of them are just down-to-the-earth normal folks trying to figure out how to live a decent life for themselves. Yet, so many of us put them on pedestals, and those on the highest pedestals are worshipped like gods. Michael Jordan was, without a doubt, the greatest basketball player of all time, and so he's on the highest pedestal. And to be honest, it makes me cringe a bit when I hear people ask former teammates, what's your favorite Michael Jordan story? Or substitute Michael Jordan for any other famous celebrity or athlete on those crazy high pedestals. These people lead the most documented, well-known lives in the world. Their vacations, relationships, children, and histories are published in sports magazines, tabloids, and shown daily on TMZ. I don't feel like they're asking to learn some unknown secret. They're asking to have a closer connection to a worship celebrity. If you're on one of those other lower pedestals, your value is defined by how close of a connection you had to those on the higher pedestals. Few people will ever ask Stacey King, hey, what's your favorite Scott Williams story? Few people will ever ask Michael Jordan, hey, Jordan, what's your favorite Stacey King story? And that's unfortunate because they should. As human beings, no one of us is truly on any higher of a pedestal than anyone else. I mean, sure, we're all different and talented in unique ways. Sure, some of us have more money than others. But these things don't determine our true worth, as that ultimately comes from God's equal love for all of us, regardless of whether we're an NBA superstar, a slightly eccentric pixel artist, or some heroin addict trying to survive the winter on the street. And it's an unfortunate truth that too many of us look for a hierarchy among ourselves. I even catch myself doing it from time to time. I'm better than this guy. This guy is better than that guy. How radical then is this Christian idea that we should try to love and value one another as God loves us equally and unconditionally? I suppose that's another reason why I got so excited to draw Stacey King here. It was a chance to celebrate a person whose biggest contribution to basketball is most often only regarded and viewed as a name on a roster without any real thought as to how hard he worked to get his name there or value beyond that point. Of course, that's not entirely fair. As I mentioned briefly before, Chicago Bulls fans today know Stacey King more as the Bulls color commentator sitting courtside with longtime Bulls play-by-play -play broadcaster Neil Funk. And the two of them are probably responsible for a huge portion of the ratings the Bulls broadcasts still get. When I told my friend Eric, a diehard Bulls fan, about the Stacey King piece, he suggested incorporating Neil Funk into it somehow, and I absolutely love the idea. I thought it would kind of allude to the partnership between the two of them today, and Eric wasn't thinking that. Eric was thinking more in terms of, like, I should replace the ball with Neil Funk's head. And while that's funny, it wasn't exactly what I was going for here. Instead, I had the idea to draw sprites of Stacey King and Neil Funk today talking to each other and then just pasting them randomly into the background to fill the stands. And the stands roughly drawn in here are of Veterans Memorial Coliseum, the then home of the Portland Trailblazers. Anyway, for a while now, I wanted to play around with using different sized pixels in my art. I did some concept art like this for my webcomic back in 2007, but I stopped publishing it before it was released. But this seemed like the perfect opportunity to bring it back and play with the idea again. So in making the background, I first shrunk the canvas size to one fourth of the original size by having the horizontal and vertical pixel count. The goal with this was to make the more detailed Stacey King in the foreground stand out by contrasting him with the more pixelated background. And it kind of works, except that my sprites I still kind of felt like were too detailed and could be contrasted better by decreasing the background resolution even further. So I try again, making the background 1 16th the resolution of the foreground, and just for good measure, I then did it again, this time making the background 1 256th of the foreground. And to be honest, I like all three of these, and I could use your help in deciding which one I should use. Either leave a comment or shoot me a message at ktracy.com letting me know which one you think is best. The highest resolution background, I think, really highlights the presence of the contemporary Stacey King and Neil Funk, but I feel like it's too much in focus for something so far away in the background. I really like the pixelated blur effect of the lowest resolution background, but you totally lose the King and Funk sprites in the background. The one in the middle is the 1 16th resolution background, and it's a compromise between the two. You can see the King and Funk sprites in the background well enough, 
but it's still blurred enough that it looks like it's in the distance. It doesn't completely do either of the things I liked in the higher resolution or lower resolution backgrounds, but it doesn't look bad by itself either, I guess. Anyway, thanks again for watching, and if you haven't yet, I do hope you consider subscribing. And hey, 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 before you go, on the left is a playlist of my other time-lapse pixel art videos, and on the right is a video that YouTube thinks you'll like based on all their nerdy computer science stuff. Either way, I think you'll have fun. Thanks again for watching.